Debbie, who's the head of the um, clinical genetics lab at Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospitals. I'm just finding the right thing to share, sorry. Um, no problem. We are putting you on the spot. <laughs> Fabulous. Can you see my... Yes. Um, I'm just trying to find the presentation mode. Oh, yeah, it's in your... Uh, yeah, yeah, there you are, yeah, yeah. Is that it? Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. perfect. OK, so it's a, the only pity is Ellen was actually going to just give an introduction to the whole new genomic medicine service in the NHS, um, which I'm sure most of you are aware of has been established over the last few years, went live in about the end of 2019. And it's been a reorganisation of how genetic testing is offered uh, nationally in the NHS. And then I was, I'm going on to just talk a bit about how it's affected testing for inherited cardiac conditions um, and, um, and how we're actually doing the testing at the moment. So um, whereas genetic testing was previously offered from a larger number of regional genetics labs, there was consolidation during the 100,000 Genomes Project um, into 13 genomic medicine centres and uh, during which whole genome sequencing was offered for patients um, with rare disease and cancer. And on the back of that, it was decided that actually whole genome sequencing could be introduced into the NHS for routine genetic testing, but that to make it effective, um, further consolidation would be required. And so now most genetic testing labs have been consolidated into seven so-called genomic laboratory hubs. And the, the idea of consolidating into these hubs was to be able to offer whole genome sequencing centrally. This is performed by Illumina and Genomics England in Cambridge, um, the sequencing in Cambridge anyway. Um, and there would be an uplift and a transformation to people performing mostly next generation sequencing in addition to whole genome sequencing using large panels um, in line with the developments uh, generally in molecular genetics. Um, and hopefully drive efficiencies. And the genomic laboratory hubs would be constructed in a hub and spoke model with a large hub, low, uh, hub lab delivering the core genetic indications and then specialist laboratories developing specialist, uh, delivering specialist testing all from the hub lab. And just in, as, as an example, um, we in London, um, in the southern part of London, belong to the Southeast Genomic Laboratory Hub. Um, and this comprises of a hub lab based at Guy's and St Thomas's, and then with spoke labs um, in the Royal Brompton and King's College Hospitals, St George's and Berkshire and, and Surrey Pathology Services. Um, I'm sure Ellen would have talked more a bit about the creation of a national test directory, and possibly she still will. Um, but one of the aims of the new genomic medicine service was to standardize testing across the country, not only geographically, but also which indications um, for which indications would be commissioned in the NHS to offer genetic testing and also what techniques and how these tests would be offered. And hence the construction of the um, development of the National Genetic Test Directory. This directory is revised every year with new indications, um, with the possibility of people suggesting new indications, changing um, eligibility criteria, and also um, making changes to which genes are included in next generation sequencing panels. And um, in addition to about three, it, it covers about 300 rare diseases. There's also a test directory for cancer. Um, and of the rare diseases, they divided into core indications, which are offered by all seven genomic laboratory hubs, and then specialist indications. And cardiology, as you can see here, is one of the specialist indications, which is offered by less than seven genomic laboratory hubs, namely in the case of cardiology, by four laboratories. Um, there some indications were initially um, prescribed for whole genome sequencing, and we now in phase two, and the first cardiac indication for whole genome sequencing went live this year, and that's for pediatric and syndromic cardiomyopathy. But other than that, the other cardiac indications are not yet being performed by whole genome sequencing. Um, 
Um, this is just an overview of the four cardiac labs in the country, so based um, in the central and south genomic laboratory hub, but with a laboratory in Oxford, in the southwest with a lab in Bristol, in the northwest with the lab in Manchester, and then our laboratory in the Royal Brompton as part of the Southeast Genomic Laboratory Hub. And we have extremely, what's been really um, rewarding about this whole new system is the working together that's um, continuing between our four cardiac labs, helping each other, advising, and also agreeing on standardization of protocols and, and how we actually perform the genetic testing. So, this is going to be very basic for those of you who work in the field, but just quickly to introduce the various cardiac inherited cardiac conditions. I'm sure the first few points you all know, they're common, they're serious, they're actionable, um, and a very common cause of death, uh, sudden death at all ages. Um, and that the genetic testing has really taken off over the last few years um, for these conditions. The cardiomyopathies, cardiac arrhythmias, aortopathies, and the congenital cardiac conditions are all included in the specialist cardiac testing. Familial hypercholesterolemia was designate, designated as a core condition, and it's offered in all the GLH labs, um, so, um, so in all seven, um, and with the aim of actually increasing the amount of testing for familial hypercholesterolemia nationally. Um, since the scene, there has been underdiagnosed um, historically. Um, and there are a number of uh, features of the inherited cardiac conditions that, which makes them slightly different from many of the other genetic conditions for which genetic testing is routinely performed. And one of the main factors is the um, often late onset of these conditions, which means that there are fewer individuals available for testing in older generations. Many of the affected relatives are deceased. If there's no way of going back and checking exactly what their phenotype was, and also it makes segregation analysis for some variants more complex. There's great allelic heterogeneity. The genes are mostly quite large, very heterogeneous, many, many variants, as Matt mentioned. Um, they're mostly, uh, most commonly autosomal dominant, but we have cases, for example, for long QT syndrome, where we can have autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant um, inheritance within a single family. Um, there are sometimes biallelic mutations despite the autosomal dominant inheritance, sometimes more than one variant in more than one gene um, causing the condition. There's a high burden of, of rare variants and so many classified as variants of uncertain significance and we know that modifiers and risk alleles play a large part as well and we think that in the future that those will become better known and, and will play an even larger part in the diagnostics as well. And then lastly, um, cascade genetic testing is extremely important in the cardiac conditions because of the possibility of providing and offering predictive testing for asymptomatic um, family members. So this is how the National Test Directory looks for the cardiovascular conditions. Um, they all have a code, and also there's a prescribed method of choice for performing the diagnostics. And as I mentioned earlier, you can see there's a single condition um, which has now gone for whole genome sequencing. Um, and they probably it will be followed um, by other conditions in the future. And for most of the other conditions, we're using large um, or smaller whole genome uh, next generation sequencing panels. Some of the labs are actually using um, uh, whole exomes and targeting the analysis to the genes that are relevant for each of the conditions. Um, primary lymphedemia historically was not included with the cardiac testing, but is now. And one of the newer indications, which for which is also a national project in conjunction with the British Heart Foundation, is for molecular autopsies following a sudden unexplained death. Um, and some, our lab in fact is, a, is a, a single provider for some of the indications, two of them very rare, um, and primary lymphedema, but just um, until other labs have possibly got their panels up and working. So this is just one example of the eligibility criteria, um, which are also in the National Test Directory. And I just wanted to stress the importance of people actually abiding by the criteria for the laboratory and for the testing in general. Um, these obviously applications can be put in to have them changed um, if, if unsuitable. And this is so it's very much a fluid process of refining them. 
but um, just to stress that you inappropriate um, referrals overburden the laboratory. They waste a lot of time with uh, questions and communication backwards and forwards um, with queries about the clinical phenotype and the suitability of, of the testing for the patient. They tend to extend then the turnaround times just because of the, the additional testing. And sadly, in some ways, may also preclude, you know, appropriate patients receiving their tests in a very timely manner if the laboratory is overburdened with many inappropriate referrals. So just a cry from the laboratory to stress the importance of abiding by the eligibility criteria for referrals. How's the testing offered? So as I mentioned, some laboratories are using whole exomes. Uh, mostly looking at the coding, only the coding regions of genes. We have a very large panel in the Brompton called the Bromptome, and um, which includes all the cardiac genes. And then we target the analysis in targeted virtual subpanels to the genes which are relevant for each of the indications. And just to give you an idea of the um, uh, numbers of referrals that we've had over the past um, five years, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy remains the largest referral cohort. Um, a lot of from um, dilated cardiomyopathy patients as well, and then smaller numbers um, for each of the other indications. The amount of testing is continues to increase with acceptance um, for of cardiac testing and also the availability now in the NHS. And this the top graph just gives an example of how the caseload has increased. Our lab was a relatively new lab, but um, the numbers continue to go up. And at the moment, we receive between 300, 350 cardiac cases um, per month. To give an idea of the sensitivity of the testing and the yield, this is um, the number of uh, patients in whom a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant is found for each of the indications. We were just plotting these figures to see if there was a change in the sensitivity of the test um, over, for example, the last three years. There doesn't seem to be a dramatic change. But you can see that the, the positive diagnostic rate of clearly pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants um, is between about 15 um, to 40 percent, um, with some indications, for example, long QT having a higher yield, um, and uh, it varies accordingly. The factors, there are various factors which can also confound um, this positive diagnostic rate, such as um, the eligibility criteria being used, um, the referral specialty, the size of the panel and the genes and how well the genes are associated with particular, con fit, um, particular conditions. And there's been a lot of work on refining that over the past few years, which genes should really be are valid for analysis and which aren't. Um, and also the stringency, particularly of the variant classification as Matt's just described. Obviously, the more strict you are about it, the um, possibly slightly lower yield, but more accurate yield. This is um, just to show in comparison to the number of next generation sequencing cases, how important the cascade and family testing has become as well. So whereas we used to receive about 50% um, of the total number of screening of probands um, in tests for family members, it's now almost equal where we receive as many tests for family members as we do for probands, simply because the more patients we diagnose with an inherited cardiac condition, the more family members there are to test. And this has become a large part of our work, in fact, is doing all the cascade family testing. Often if the proband in the family was diagnosed a long time ago, um, the variant has to be reassessed for its pathogenicity just to be are absolutely certain that it is um, valid to go ahead and test um, other family members. I thought I'd just quickly give one example of the importance of the, the working together of the different laboratories um, nationally and also just um, the importance of the cascade testing. So this is a patient, um, the proband uh, was referred at age 62 with a clinical diagnosis of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Sadly, his son had actually passed away in his 30s um, and was subsequently realized to be affected with an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, but had never had genetic testing. Um, we performed the test um, for arrhythmogenic, for ARVC, in fact, um, and uh, found a pathogenic variant in the PKP2 gene, which um, encodes placophilin. 
um, and it was a known that the classification of the variant um, resulted in it being classified as being pathogenic. It was a truncating variant. We know that truncating variants are mostly pathogenic. And um, placophilin is a well-known um, gene for ARVC um, involved in the um, intercellular junctions of the cardiomyocytes called desmosomes. Um, and just based since the session was on sports cardiology, I thought it would be important to mention that this has actually been a well-known cause of sudden and unexpected death. I mean, sportsman Fabrice Mwamba was a football player who was resusc resuscitated in the FA Cup final in 2012 for 45 minutes um, but, um, and survived, fortunately. And James Taylor had to retire from cricket quite recently um, with a similar um, condition also fortunately um, diagnosed um, uh, in time. So to go back to our family, this is the index patient who was referred um, for genetic testing and found to have the PKP2 variant. Um, he was referred uh, initially from St. George's, um, then uh, when taking the family history realized that he had a number of SIBs um, and uh, cousins who were affected, um, who also had had cardiac conditions, testing of those affected individuals in the family was performed and they were all found to um, have the same pathogenic variant. It was then realized, so they were after just one screening test, one next generation sequencing test, there were five cascade tests of affected um, performed. It was then realized that they were all due to those positive individuals, this large number of 19 further individuals in the family um, from different centers, which the family was linked up via the different um, clinical genetic services and labs and found to all be were all asymptomatic, but were all at risk of also having the same variant. So cascade testing was performed in all those individuals, 19 predictive tests, 13 were negative, six were positive. Um, so those individuals at least knew whether or not they were at risk um, for having the same condition, the last branch of the family actually came from Bristol. So a nice example of the labs and the clinical genetic services all working together. So in all, we tested 25 um, family members distributed across the three genomic hubs. And this um, case also just nicely illustrates the age-related penetrance, but obviously you can see in the fifth to seventh decade of life, the four affected individuals three in the third to fifth decade in the next generation, and then in the younger individuals um, between the first and third decade of life, all able to have predictive testing, none of them showing symptoms yet. Debbie, so just in so summary, you know, uh, yeah, you're summarizing. I was gonna yeah, say we've just yeah. got one yeah. minute left, okay? Okay, Please. very quickly. Um, just the, the advantage, which I'm sure most of you are, are well aware of the diagnostic precision, um, which comes from uh, genetic testing, which may influence um, therapeutic options, enables targeted therapy, informs prognosis, and also directs uh, cardiological surveillance in patients and their relatives. There are many challenges that still remain. It would be boring if there weren't. Um, and the accurate classification and interpretation of variants, as Matt has previously described, is one of them. Um, also, the, to find robust curation of new genes, which, which are often published um, in association with the cardiac conditions, and understanding variable phenot uh, phenotype penetrance within and between families. And we think in the future we'll be increasingly applying polygenic risk scores. However, they still need to um, have proven clinical utility. So that's probably the direction of travel. Um, yeah, so I don't need to mention this last slide was just giving examples of how the four labs work together, but um, I think I've, I've probably said that already. And then just to thank our whole service who've contributed to the development of the testing in the Brompton. Thank I think you're going to leave much. questions for later, Ellie. Yeah, yeah we'll leave questions yeah. for later, but thank you, Debbie. That was just such a great example of, you know, how complex it is bringing together all this family information, but also what a impact that can have on the family and being able to determine who needs to be screened. So um, in the interest of